Turn with me to James chapter 5. If you're there, it reads, Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be unto God. You may take your seats. As you take your seats, look at your neighbor. Do me a favor. Tell him these words. Say, keep my name, keep my name. In, your in your mouth. Keep my name in your mouth. That, that's, that's what we need. Let's pray. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. We need a word from you, God. We didn't come just for form or fashion, but we've come to meet with you. So speak now, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Keep my name in your mouth. Church, there is a phrase that has become prevalent uh, amongst those who have arrived at a bitter disagreement. Uh, this phrase often arises after someone has said something malicious or disrespectful about someone else behind their back. And as the news travels to that offended person, oftentimes they are looking for a way to guard themselves against further attack or further slander. And so upon sight of the opposition, sometimes they can be heard uttering these words, keep my name out your mouth. I know, I know no one here has ever used that phrase. But maybe you know somebody who has used that phrase on an occasion. We only need to watch reality TV for a moment to hear uh, one housewife say to another, keep my name out your mouth. In Super Bowl 39 in 2005, the Philadelphia Eagles lost to the New England Patriots. And the loss sparked a controversy in the Eagles locker room. Uh, there was a wide receiver named Terrell Owens. He was a very popular receiver, and the quarterback at that time was named Donovan McNabb, and, and they began to, to butt heads as a result of the loss. And so when the media came and asked Donovan McNabb about comments that were directed toward him, he directed a comment to his critics, and he said, just keep my name out your mouth. Numerous singers and rappers have use this phrase in lyrics in their songs. And yes, on occasion, even friends and family members have said this to one another. And church, brothers and sisters, I pray that you are never in a situation where you feel the urge or the need to tell someone not to mention your name. <laughs> for on the contrary, the Bible teaches us that we should strive for unity in all our relationships even when the flesh desires the opposite. Somebody say amen. <laughs> I know it's hard right there. It's supposed to look at me like, Pastor, I don't know. The Bible says that we're called to strive for unity for one, with one another. And today, the text says, rather than telling someone not to mention your name, you really ought to be looking and searching for people who are willing to call your name out loud in prayer. I recognize that I would not be here if someone had not prayed for me. Can I get a witness? Is there anybody in the house who can say, Pastor, I know 
I know I wouldn't be where I am if people had not been praying for me. Whether you realize it or not, you would not be here without the prayers of the righteous. That, that, that car you drive, that home you live in, that food you ate this morning, that, that job that you have, you would not have it had somebody not been praying for you. Uh, there's somebody here who can say, you know what, Pastor, there were times where I didn't even know what to pray for myself. But I thank God that I had a praying grandmother. I, I had a praying mother. I had a praying father who, who knew how to lift up the words of prayer. The old song said, somebody prayed for me had me on that somebody knows that song had me on their mind took the time see see they had to set aside some time i i thank god there are some folks who know how to set aside time and pray for me and and then the song says i'm so glad they prayed in the church where i grew up that's where the folk will get excited they, they say i'm so glad they prayed for me church this is part of the fabric of our faith that we believe in the power of praying for one another. Wouldn't it be awesome if you knew that every week there was somebody praying for you by name and by need? Now, I'm not just talking about your mother, your mother or your father. They pray for you all the time. They, they lift your grandma going to pray for you. But wouldn't it be awesome if somebody who was not in your biological bloodline knew your name and knew your prayer request and lifted you up in prayer every week? I, I don't know about you, but that's what I need in my life. And this is what happens when we make a decision to truly love one another. Love is an action, church, and we must decide to do life together and live like the Bible calls us to live. That's, that's why we're so excited about Man Up and Women of the Word, because it creates an opportunity for you to get around some brothers and some sisters and, and even to get into some small groups and, and be able to share a prayer request and know that somebody's going to call my name out this week. I, I just need to know some week somebody's calling my name. So why? Why do we need to pray for each other? Number one, your prayers help me fall forward. Your prayers help me fall forward. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. Tell him I know. <laughs> regardless, regardless of how high a view of ourselves we may have, at some point we must acknowledge our imperfections. We must acknowledge that we are not all that we desire to be. The Apostle Paul says this clearly in Romans chapter 3 when he says, We all fall short of the glory of God. The prophet Isaiah, he says that our righteousness is like filthy rags in comparison to God. And so James speaks to us today and he says, Confess your sins to one another and pray for each other. Watch closely. In verse 16, James does not say, if you have sinned, he says, confess your sins. <laughs> he understands that the question is not whether you have sinned or not. The question is, have you been open enough to tell somebody who can pray for you? You see, he, he's saying that there is power in our confession. Pastor, wait a minute. My, my sins are between me and God. <laughs> I can't tell anybody. I can't tell anybody what I'm going through. But James says there is actual power in your confession. And he's not just talking about talking to a priest in a booth. But he's talking about the body of believers actually talking to one another. Here's why. Don't miss this. Because if I only confess to God, I might get confused and think he's only a divine eraser and not a divine ruler. What, what do you mean, Pastor? What do you mean? Think about the difference between an eraser and a ruler. An eraser is designed just to remove the mistake, but the ruler reminds you of what the standard is. Uh, some of y'all missed that. Uh, the, the ruler reminds you of what you're trying to measure up to. Uh, and see, if I only tell God, sometimes, sometimes uh, I get confused to thinking, well, he's just going to erase it and I'm all good. But I've got to learn how to open up my mouth to a brother and say, you know what? I fell short and it reminds me of God's standards. I know I'm not going to get too many amens right here, church, but, but I'm going to preach it anyway. 
Can, can I keep it real with you all? There, there are some things that I don't do because I love God and I love my family. And so I made a decision that, that I'm, I'm going to walk right in these ways because I got enough of the spirit of God in me to keep me on the right track. Amen. But then watch this now. There are some other things that I don't do because I don't want to look my accountability partner in the eye and tell him I fell short again. Some of y'all missed that thing right there. <laughs> because oftentimes I can, I can tell God about the same sin 99 times and just keep on doing it. But when I know I got to go into a room and look at my brother who's been praying for me and tell him I did the same thing this week that I asked you to pray for me against last week, somehow that has a way of getting me to move in the right direction and not to fall backward, but to fall forward. I, I need a few folks who can say amen. You see, every, every now and then, it's powerful to have to look somebody in the eye and say, this is where I'm struggling. My wife and I were on the, on the highway, on the interstate. We were driving, and all of a sudden, everybody began to slow down on the highway. And we began to wonder, what, what's going on? Is there an, an accident or something going on up the road? Everybody was, was slowing down. And, and after a while, we kept driving, and we realized that a state trooper had just come on to the highway. <laughs> We realized that, that the reason for the slowdown was the trooper was now on the highway. And so watch this, y'all. Folks didn't slow down because the speed limit sign said slow down. Because the sign had always been there. Folks slowed down because now there was somebody on the highway who could ask them about their speed. And every once in a while, you need some folk in your life who can ask you about your speed because otherwise you might not slow down. I, I wish somebody was hearing what I'm saying today. We, we, we need some folk in our lives who can say, I love you and I can see you moving too fast. I love you and that's not the way God has called us to live. There's power in having some folk who you can talk to. Now, now, let me, let me warn you, don't just put all your business in the street. But you ought to have somebody who you can be real with, who knows what it means to keep something in, in confidence, who knows that I'm hearing this so I can pray for you and not talk about you. You see, when I, when I, I confess something, I am inviting your prayers. Because otherwise, you just might pray whatever comes to your mind. But I need some folk who can pray for me by name and by need. I, I need some folk who can say specifically, heal the asthma. I, you, I, I don't need folk who can just say, I pray he, he's doing well. No, I need folk who can say, I, I need you to work in the marriage, God. I need you to work in his parenting. I need you to work in his family's life so that healing can come forward. Because even though I fall, your prayers help me to fall forward. This evening, many of you will gather around television sets and you will watch a game called the Super Bowl. There will be points during this game where the runner or the person with the ball will break through tackles and they'll get all the way to the end zone. The crowd is going to go crazy. But there will be other points where the person with the ball will get tackled. And I want you to pay close attention tonight what happens when they're getting tackled. Because what happens is they know they're going down. They know they're going to fall on the ground when this tackle takes place. But even as they're getting tackled, they still make an attempt to fall forward. <laughs> when, even while they're, while they're getting tackled and folk got them wrapped up and they're on their way to the ground, they're trying to figure out, can I just get one more yard? Can I, can I get one more inch? Because I don't want to go backward. I want to go forward. And God says that if we're really going to live like he calls us to live, it doesn't mean we don't fall. It just means that we fall forward. That means whatever I'm going through I don't want to fall back into where I used to be even though I fall I want to fall forward so I can make progress for the glory of God and the reason we pray for each other is your prayers help me fall forward that's the first thing James wants to help us understand our prayers help each other fall forward but secondly we must recognize that when we pray for each other or when we don't pray, really, our healing is hindered by that failure to pray. 
our healing, your healing is hindered by a failure to pray for one another. That, that's why I sense the urge of the, of the Spirit of the Lord calling us to, to enter into some moments of prayer this morning because I believe that there's somebody that got healed this morning. You, you may not feel it in your body right now, but I believe that the power to heal is in this place. And so our failure to pray hinders our healing. One of the most quoted scriptures about prayer in the Bible comes from 2 Chronicles 7 and 14. Many of you will know it when you hear it. God says, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. And then he says this, I will heal their land. God says a part of his response to prayer is healing. And he's not just speaking about physical healing, but he's speaking about the kind of healing that impacts minds, bodies, communities, families, schools, cities, nations. God says, if you want healing, you need to step your prayer game up. If you really want healing, you've got to seek me in prayer. And I'm not saying that every prayer produces a healing, but I am saying that the lack of prayer hinders it. So James says, pray for each other so that you may be healed. This healing that we desire, sometimes it is a physical healing. But sometimes it might even be a financial breakthrough that God brings as a result of prayer. Somebody say amen. amen. Anybody need a financial breakthrough in the house? Amen. amen. But watch this, you all. Sometimes it is the healing of a mindset so that we can begin to accept what God allowed. Uh, I need y'all to stay there with me for a moment. Sometimes, sometimes we're praying and we're seeking the Lord to heal and deliver. And what God does, he does heal, but he heals our mind first so that we can accept where we are before he brings us out. Because we got to get to a place where we can accept what God is doing sometimes before he's ready, ready to release us. And God says, if you learn how to pray right, I'll bring about a healing in your mind that may not change your circumstances around you but it will change you in the circumstance there was there was a, a great fire in the city of Chicago in the year 1871 a man named Horatio Spafford he had invested in property in the region where the fire ravaged the city he lost all of his investment in that property he had been planning a trip with his family overseas, and they had to postpone the trip because of all that they had lost. And then sometime later, he was able then to reschedule the trip, and he sent his wife and four daughters ahead of him on the ship. They began to, to travel toward Europe, and then tragedy struck. The story is told that he got word that his wife and his daughters were in a shipwreck, and his wife survived, but all four of his daughters perished. He was tormented in turmoil for some time, and he began a journey to meet his wife. He was struggling, but there were people who were praying for him. You see, Horatio Spafford was a man of, of great faith, but his faith had been rocked, and, and he didn't know how to move forward. But he was traveling to meet his wife. And the story is told that when he got there, he was riding in a boat. As he passed the area where his daughters had died, he was inspired to write down some words. These are the words he wrote. When peace like a river attends my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll. See, he, he was on the sea, and he was looking at the sea billows, and, and he said, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot is, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. He had just been through the most hellacious moment in his life, but as he rode there, he was able to say to God, it is well with my soul. Healing like this can only come when folks are praying for you. Healing like this doesn't come automatically. It comes when some folks around you know the words of prayer and they know how to live 
lift you up. And his healing inspires our healing because now all over the world in times of trouble, people who don't even know his name stand up and say, it is well with my soul. At my aunt's funeral on last week, we stood there and we sang these words in the middle of tragedy, it is well with my soul. And see, God says, the only reason why we don't have the healing we desire sometimes is because of our failure to pray. Do you know what one of the most common lies in church is? Anybody know? Maisha got it. I'll be praying for you. There it is. That's one of the most common lies in church. Now, we, we mean well, right? We mean well when we say this to folks, I'll be praying for you, but it has become more of a cliche than a promise because many of us don't follow through on those words. Let me make it real practical, church. It's real hard to follow through when we don't write it down. We got all kinds of mobile devices. I, I just learned I got to have my phone on my hip and I have a, a note file that says prayer request. So when somebody tells me if I don't jot it down while I'm talking to you, when I get back to my desk, I just jot it down so that I have somewhere to remind me of what you asked. Because otherwise, I'm going to be in my prayer closet saying, well, what did they say? So number one, we don't do it because we don't write it down. But we also oftentimes have not set aside time to pray. So I can say I'll be praying for you, but if I don't have any time in my life that I've set aside to lift up prayers, it might not happen. And I'm not saying everybody has to set aside two or three hours in the closet to pray to God, but, but can you pray while you're doing the dishes? Can you, can you have a list next to the sink? Can you pray while you're driving to work? You don't really have to listen to Steve Harvey every day. Can, can you pray while you're driving to work? Can you, can you be bold enough to set aside some time when you get home at night? You don't have to watch HGTV or ESPN. For 30 minutes, you can set aside some time and say, let me actually pray for what I told folk I'd be praying for. Uh, this, this, this is a challenge to you and me during this season as we approach this prayer campaign. Do you have a place where you can write down those prayer requests? Do you have a time where you can pray for folks? And are you willing to actually check back in and ask somebody, how's it going? I've been praying for you. Because this is what I believe you'll find. You'll find that healing happens as a result of faithful prayer. There's some folks who have been on my prayer list, and I've come back to them and said, how is it going? And they say, Pastor God worked it out. And I believe that healing happens as a result of faithful prayer. So number one today, we all fall short, but our prayer, your prayers will help me fall forward. Our healing is hindered by our failure to pray. But thirdly and finally, my prayers for you produce a better me. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm trying to get better. I'm trying to get better. My prayers for you produce a better me. After James talks about healing that comes through prayer, he says the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. The King James Version says the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. James is saying that prayer is especially powerful when people approach it with the right heart. When people approach it with the proper posture toward God. Let me help you. Let me break it down real simple. He's saying you can get more prayers through if you're living right. <laughs> Somebody say amen. amen. He says the prayers of a righteous man are powerful and effective. He said, look, if you're living right, you can get a few more prayers through. Now, now, I don't want you to take this the wrong way. Because some will say, well, because the prayer of the righteous is effective, I'm going to take all my prayer requests to somebody who's real righteous. <laughs> and, so, and so I'm just going to say, if I can get to the deacon, if I can just get to the pastor, if I can get to the pope, then I know that I can get my prayers answered. But I don't believe that's the takeaway, church. James says pray for one another. 
Here's what happens then. As my concern for you grows, my prayers for you increase. And as my prayer for you increases, I want to be more righteous because I recognize that the prayers of the righteous avail much. And so I don't want to waste my time if my prayers can't break through. So I want to learn how to live better so that my prayer time will actually work. You see, while, while I'm praying for you, what I realize then is that God is working on me. And so I don't have to get caught up in only asking for prayers for myself, but I ought to be willing and able to pray for somebody else because as I'm praying for you, God is working on me and I got to trust God that he's got somebody else around the corner who is calling my name out too. I just can't come to God with me, myself, and I, but I believe when I come to God with your name and with your name and with your name, God says, I'm going to work it out for you, Brian, not because you asked, but because you're willing to pray for somebody else. God says, while you're praying for them, I'm working on you. I'm teaching you compassion. I'm teaching you empathy. I'm teaching you how to surrender. I'm teaching you patience. I'm teaching you mercy. And Jesus said, blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. God says when you're willing to pour out into somebody else, you might not realize it, but your blessing is on the way. Uh, it takes, takes a serious commitment to say, I'm going to pour into somebody else. When I was, when I, let me illustrate this. When I was in, in, in grad school, I, I got into a, a study group study group, we were working together to try to pass these tests. And, and what I realized after a few tests, I realized I was doing a little better than some of the folks in my study group. And so I said to myself, I got to get me a new study group. <laughs> because I need some folk in the group who are doing better than me. I said, I, said, I need some folk in the group who, who, can, who can lift me up. Some folks who are doing better than me. But God said, no, you don't need another study group. This is what he said. He said, the reason why you're doing well is because you've got somebody to pour into. And if you go somewhere where you only want to receive, you're going to miss the blessing of being poured out. Because he said this, what's happening is when you're pouring out into other folks, you're learning more than you ever would if somebody would just pour into you. God says it's the same with prayer. When you start pouring out into other folks' lives and other folks prayer request that's when more comes and is poured into you and the blessings you receive you won't even have enough room to receive it God says you got to have some people in your life who will keep your name in their mouth how awesome would it be if you could know without a shadow of a doubt that two or three people were calling your name 52 weeks a year. Wouldn't that be awesome? I don't know about you, but I just feel stronger when I know folks are really praying for me. Not, not when they just give me the cliche, but when I know folks are, are praying for me. When I, when I can call the name of, of Pastor Will Baker, I can call the name of, of my brother Joseph Evans, I can say, you know what, I know they're praying for me. It's, it's not just lip service but they're calling my name. Is there somebody in your circle who you know is calling your name in prayer? We invite you to take the risk of getting connected through Man Up, Women of the Word, or some other vehicle that somebody might be able to call your name in prayer and you might be able to return that favor. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that your word is true, that the prayers of the righteous avail much. We thank you, Lord God, that you've called us to a point of decision where we've got to decide if we really want to grow in you. God, we recognize, I recognize that it won't be easy to step out on faith and to take that risk to open up our hearts to some folks who we don't know that well. But God, we trust that you are drawing us together by the power of your spirit. 
and that your love, perfect love, cast out all fear. We trust you to do a new thing in our midst. And so we honor you for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.